Basic Interpretation of HRCT, Part 1. Presented by Dr. Jul Mohsin Udin, DTCD, FCPS, Pulmonology. We will discuss the following subjects Anatomy of the Secondary Lobule, Basic HRCT Patterns, Distribution of Abnormalities, Differential Diagnosis of Interstitial Lung Diseases. Objectives of presentation To increase the skill of interpretation of HRCT of the students Sometimes our interpretation become limited only in ILD but with the help of HRCT and appropriate history taking we can reach definite causes of ILD In many cases of ILD, lung biopsy is not possible, then HRCT become most important tool Secondary lobule Knowledge of the lung anatomy is essential for understanding HRCT. The secondary lobule is the basic anatomic unit of pulmonary structure and function. Interpretation of interstitial lung diseases is based on the type of involvement of the secondary lobule. It is the smallest lung unit that is surrounded by connective tissue septa. It measures about 1 to 2 cm and is made up of 515 pulmonary acini that contain the alveoli for gas exchange. The secondary lobule is supplied by a terminal bronchiole in the center, dark color, that is paralleled by the central lobular artery, blue color, pulmonary veins, red color, and lymphatics yellow color, run in the periphery of the lobule within the interlobular sector. Under normal conditions only a few of these very thin septa will be seen. There are two lymphatic systems, a central network, that runs along the bronchovascular bundle towards the center of the lobule and a peripheral network, that is located within the interlobular septa and along the pleural linings. Central lobular area, is the central part of the secondary lobule, central blue area, it is usually the site of diseases, that enter the lung through the airways that is hypersensitivity pneumonitis, respiratory bronchiolitis, centrilobular emphysema. Perilymphatic area is the peripheral part of the secondary lobule, yellow line. It is usually the site of diseases, that are located in the lymphatic system, that is sarcoid, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, pulmonary edema. These diseases also spread in the central network of lymphatics that surround the bronchovascular bundle. A structured approach to interpretation of HRCT involves the following questions. 1. What is the dominant HR pattern? Reticular. Nodular. High attenuation, ground glass, consolidation. Low attenuation, emphysema, cystic. 2. Where is it located within the secondary lobule, central lobular, perilymphatic or andum? 3. Is there an upper versus lower zone or a central versus peripheral predominance? 4. Are there additional findings, pleural fluid, lymphadenopathy, traction bronchiectasis? Points prior interpretation. 1. These morphologic findings have to be combined with the history of the patient and important clinical findings. 2. When we study patients with HRCT, we have to realize that we are looking at a selected group of patients. 3. Common diseases like pneumonias, pulmonary emboli, cardiogenic edema and lung carcinoma are already ruled out. 4. So uncommon diseases like sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, usual interstitial pneumonitis, UIP, and many others become regular HRCT diagnoses. A. Reticular pattern. In the reticular pattern there are too many lines, either as a result of thickening of the interlobular septa or as a result of fibrosis as in honeycombing. Reticular pattern is produced by septal thickening. Thickening of the lung interstitium by fluid, fibrous tissue, or infiltration by cells results in a pattern of reticular opacities due to thickening of the interlobular septa. Septal thickening two types. Smooth septal thickening is usually seen in interstitial pulmonary edema, curly B lines on chest film, 
lymph hangitic spread of carcinoma or lymphoma and alveolar proteinosis. Nodular or irregular septal thickening occurs in lymph hangitic spread of carcinoma or lymphoma, sarcoidosis and silicosis. Example of irregular septal thickening. On the left we see focal irregular septal thickening in the right upper lobe in a patient with a known malignancy. This finding is typical for lymph hangitic carcinomatosis. There are also additional findings that support this diagnosis like mediastinal lymph nodes and a nodular lesion in the left lung that probably represents a metastasis. Short note on lymph hangitic carcinomatosis. Pulmonary lymph hangitic carcinomatosis, PLC. In 50% of patients the septal thickening is focal or unilateral. This finding is helpful in distinguishing PLC from other causes of interlobular septal thickening like sarcoidosis or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Hyla lymphadenopathy is visible in 50% and usually there is a history of adenocarcinoma. Identical findings can be seen in patients with lymphoma and in children with HIV infection, who develop lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis LIP, a rare benign infiltrative lymphocytic disease. Septal thickening in pulmonary edema. There is a combination of smooth septal thickening and ground glass opacity with a gravitational distribution. Thickening of the peribronchovascular interstitium, which is called peribronchial cuffing, and fissural thickening are also common. Common additional findings are an enlarged heart and pleural fluid are present in OVF. Crazy paving, another reticular pattern. On the left a patient with both septal thickening and ground glass opacity in a patchy distribution. Some lobules are affected and others are not. This combination of findings is called crazy paving. Crazy paving was thought to be specific for alveolar proteinosis, but is also seen in many other diseases such as pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, bronchoalveolar carcinoma, sarcoidosis, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, organizing pneumonia, COP, adult respiratory distress syndrome and pulmonary hemorrhage. Short note on alveolar proteinosis. Alveolar proteinosis is a rare diffuse lung disease of unknown etiology characterized by alveolar and interstitial accumulation of a periodic acid CIF, PAS, stain positive phospholipoprotein derived from surfactant. B. Nodular pattern. The distribution of nodules shown on HRCT is the most important factor in making an accurate diagnosis of the ILD with nodular pattern. In most cases small nodules can be placed into one of three categories. Perilymphatic Centrilobular or Random distribution Location of nodules Centrilobular distribution in certain diseases, nodules are limited to the centrilobular region. Unlike perilymphatic and random nodules, centrilobular nodules spare the pleural surfaces. The most peripheral nodules are centered 5 to 10 mm from fissures or the pleural surface. Random distribution Nodules are randomly distributed relative to structures of the lung and secondary lobule. Nodules can usually be seen to involve the pleural surfaces and fissures, but lack the supleural predominance often seen in patients with a perilymphatic distribution. How will you identify various type of nodular distribution? The algorithm to distinguish perilymphatic, random and centrilobular nodules is the following. Look for the presence of pleural nodules. These are often easiest to see along the fissures. If a pleural nodules are absent or few in number, the distribution is likely centrilobular. If a pleural nodules are visible, the pattern is either random or perilymphatic. If there are pleural nodules and also nodules along the central bronchovascular interstitium and along interlobular septa, you are dealing with a perilymphatic distribution. If the nodules are diffuse and uniformly distributed, it is likely a random distribution. Algorithm for diagnosis of diseases which radiologically show various nodular patterns. 
differential diagnosis of perilymphatic nodule. Perilymphatic distribution. Perilymphatic nodules are most commonly seen in sarcoidosis. They also occur in silicosis, coal workers' pneumoconiosis and lymphangitic spread of carcinoma. Notice the overlap in differential diagnosis of perilymphatic nodules and the nodular septal thickening in the reticular pattern. Sometimes the term reticular nodular is used. Radiological features of sarcoidosis in HRCT. On the left a typical case of perilymphatic distribution of nodules in a patient with sarcoidosis. Notice the nodules along the fissures indicating a perilymphatic distribution, red arrows. Always look carefully for these nodules in the suppleural region and along the fissures, because this finding is very specific for sarcoidosis. Typically in sarcoidosis is an upper lobe and perihula predominance and in this case we see the majority of nodules located along the bronchovascular bundle, yellow arrow. On the left another typical case of sarcoidosis. In addition to the perilymphatic nodules, there are multiple enlarged lymph nodes, which is also typical for sarcoidosis. In end-stage sarcoidosis we will see fibrosis, which is also predominantly located in the upper lobes and parietilla. Central obular distribution of nodules in various diseases. Central obular nodules are seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, respiratory bronchiolitis in smokers, infectious airways diseases, endobronchial spread of tuberculosis or non-tuberculous mycobacteria, bronchopneumonia. Uncommon in bronchioloalveolar carcinoma, pulmonary edema, vasculitis. In many cases central obular nodules are of ground glass density and ill-defined figure. They are called acinare nodules. Tree and bud, special type of centrilobular nodule. In centrilobular nodules the recognition of tree in bud is of value for narrowing the differential diagnosis. Tree in bud describes the appearance of an irregular and often nodular branching structure, most easily identified in the lung periphery. It represents dilated and impacted, mucus or pus filled, centrilobular bronchioles. Differential diagnosis of tree in bud. Tree in bud almost always indicates the presence of endobronchial spread of infection, TB, MAC, any bacterial bronchopneumonia, airway disease associated with infection, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis. Less often, an airway disease associated primarily with mucus retention, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, asthma. Early diagnosis of PTB by HRCT. On the left a tree in bud is seen. In the proper clinical setting suspect active endobronchial spread of TB. In most patients with active tuberculosis, the HRCT shows evidence of bronchogenic spread of disease even before bacteriologic results are available. Random distribution of nodules. On the left a patient with random nodules as a result of miliary TB. The random distribution is a result of the hematogenous spread of the infection. Random nodules are seen in hematogenous metastasis, miliary tuberculosis, miliary fungal infections. Sarcoidosis may mimic this pattern, when very extensive. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, early nodular stage. Sarcoidosis usually has a perilymphatic distribution, but when it is very extensive, it spreads along the bronchovascular bundle to the periphery of the lung and may reach the central obular area. Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Langerhans cell histiocytosis is an uncommon disease characterized by multiple cysts in patients with nicotine abuse. In a very early stage, these patients show only nodules that later on cavitate and become cysts, figure. As in all smoking related diseases, there is an upper lobe predominance. Thank you all. End of part 1